Mo can hear me. I can no longer hear any of you, um, which is cool, I guess. I guess I can pop in perfect silence. Anyway, um, hi, I'm Dave Tott. I've been doing the buffer bloat thing for almost 15 years now. And uh, back in 2012, we solved the problem. And watching the deployment go by very slow and it's been very difficult. That's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'll try to speak up. My microphone is there. Is this good? Is this better? All right. So the executive summary of where we stand today after 15 years of effort is that most ISPs still have buffer bloat, but there's a lot of positive things happening in the quality of experience world and in Wi-Fi and on Starlink. I'm coming to you live via Starlink today. I'm hoping that I come through okay, aside from me not talking loud enough. Um, smart queue management has become the default for smart users to go manage buffer bloated networks. Uh-oh, what? What's wrong, Jacob? Uh, I can't get any closer to the microphone than this. Can I shout? Oh, okay, you guys have a different tool. So I can play music while you do that, or I can just uh, recite poetry or whatever you want me to do. Okay. So I keep testing. Testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, testing. Watching the chat go by. <laughs> Oh, I can increase my volume too. Cake is in partly a backronym. We were picking on a different algorithm called Pi, and uh, and it just sucked. <laughs> so we gave it a backronym called uh, Common Applications Remain Hacked, and that's how it ended up. All right, back to my topic here. I'm hoping that everybody in this room knows what buffer boat is. Those of you that do know, raise your hand. Cheer me up. Those of you that are paying attention, raise your hand. So I still have to explain it to those of you who don't have it up. Basically, we have a funnel that connects everything to everything else. And at 100 gigabits, this funnel's egress is really, really tiny to come out at, at 100 megabits. And algorithms to manage this properly turn out to be really complicated and difficult. So aside from that, there's been wonderful presentations and everyone that had their hand up that knows what buffer boat is, go bug them. Okay. So we're good on volume. All right, thanks. So today I'm gonna to talk about the state of the bloat in the two countries for which I have data for. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the kernel. I wanna apologize in the past few years, I haven't been able to pay much attention to the kernel development. I'm mostly hanging Oh, 10 versions behind in the embedded versions of the world. I'm also going to talk about bloat of the cloud on Ethernet, 5G, 5G, and Wi-Fi and Starlink, and two new bufferboat.net projects starting up this quarter. So this is a the Measuring Broadband America report put together by the FCC. And it illustrates the scope of the problem in building the metaverse, having reliable gaming, being able to multiplex Zoom while doing big uploads and downloads. And at the 95th percentile, we see a latency inflation under load of several hundred percent. Uh, and at the 99th percentile, it's even worse. And you don't even want to talk about the maximum. And this is after 10 years of trying to deploy fixes. We still see latency variations. Like just to give you an idea, looking at the fiber, fiber is great, right? So uh, the goes from seven milliseconds to 120. And while most of our protocols have been designed to handle this kind of stuff, we still have jitter and things freezing and stuff like that, unless we actually focused on trying to reduce peak latencies across the internet. Another country that um, did a report recently, they've been doing one quarterly. Uh, this demonstrates all the different technologies and speeds available. The idle latency is the first bar. So to pick on oh, uh, fiber, 300 megabit fiber, the baseline latency is 10 milliseconds. And the 
uh, peak latency on this particular test for the levels of additional statistical legend domain is 42 milliseconds while you're actually using the link. And with the techniques that we've developed through the uh, Linux and the buffer bloat project, we have the ability to keep those latencies relatively flat under load, but they really haven't deployed. It turns out that if you recalculate these against the actual speed, it turns out that almost all these devices have a thousand packets of buffer, which is uh, 10 times too much or more. And they don't have any smart algorithms like FTCODL to actually manage the systems. So the technology is done for most of us in the Linux world. It just has to deploy. And expressing to the public that bandwidth is in everything has been a large portion of what I've been up to for the last few years. And if ever any of you have a feeling, want to take a pot shot at your local regulator to explain that latency and bandwidth are two entirely separate things, please join us. Uh, we had a lot of fun with this one. Um, over here, I have now managed to explain to the Republican side of the FCC uh, that what buffer bloat is and what latency is. I had a chance to play with Ajit Pai, backing him up while he sang a couple songs, and I explained to him that all the headaches, most of the headaches he took from buffer bloat from the uh, network neutrality controversies were actually generated by buffer bloat, and he gets it now. Not seeing a whole lot of clue on the other side of the FCC so far. So over the years, we've developed a lot of really great tools for measuring latency under load. Uh, the premier one is Toki Oiland Jorgensen. Uh, he's in the audience. Thanks, Wave. Um, there, uh, Clint Suite. He just landed version 2.2. That has 120 tests that can plot over time all the differences in, in network behaviors you can possibly see, and I really wish more people used it. Uh, Bob McMahon is the author of iPerf, uh, and iPerf is used pretty heavily in this community, but it seems like none of you have looked at the progress that's been made in measuring additional statistics in the latest versions of iPerf. So please check that out. There's a new tool called Crusader. Uh, it's written in Rust, which is the first tool we've had that tests the right things for latency and load on everything, including Windows. There's a new one I'm going to talk about just landed yesterday from Dave Seddon called XT, XTCP2, which allows you to monitor existing applications and containers to see what the round trip times and uh, throughput actually are. There's a new one called Network Quality from Apple, uh, which is written in Go, has all kinds of other stuff. I have a tool I've not had time to work on called Where's the Buffer Bloat? And if anybody wants to help me on that, and over the last few years, every single major speed test site has added metrics to measure latency on the load. Uh, this one on the right here is a copy of uh, what Netflix is doing. They sit there and they measure uh, what the responsiveness is, which is measured in this case in milliseconds. So at a given download thing, they have a worst case of 480 milliseconds on the download, a half a second of additional latency, which tends to interfere with interactive traffic. Um, so Dave Seddon's XTCP landed yesterday, uh, and basically it allows you to dump TCP diagnostic information, not just round trip times, to the cloud and be able to analyze what the heck is going on behind your containers. Now, in watching kernel development in the last uh, quarter and knowing I was going to come to this, I was really happy to see Vertio uh, BQL. Uh, Virtio Net got BQL, and they saw significant advantages while running TCP stream against TCP RR. I think it's possible to do better than that. But one of my concerns going forward with the BQL subsystem is you end up with one queue per core. And as you add cores, you have a static latency living below FQ column where it cannot be managed. Now, I just did this math real quickly. If I've got this wrong, if I'm off by an order of magnitude, but it looked like it's over eight milliseconds of data can get stuck in the kernel at 10 gigabits with 64 cores and 64 queues. If I got that wrong, forgive me. The other one that bothers me in dealing with the cloud is all the additional stuff living in hypervisors and VMs and containers and in the proxies themselves and in send buffs. And anytime that the CPU is able to outrun data, it's going to the wire. Similarly, Nappy was a really great idea when it first came up. And we had this magic number of 64 in there uh, before we 
start cleaning out the cues and again multiply that by the number of cores in your latency has a worst case bound that goes higher. Um, and overall, we have this gut feeling in this community that, oh, milliseconds is enough. And I'm, I know I'm an extremist, but going for 100 microseconds or a microsecond for anything involving um, the difference between processing time and TCP time is there. Remember that a packet at 10, at 10 gigabits is only a few nanoseconds long, and yet it takes milliseconds to process one. So if we can keep thinking about reducing latencies, it would be great inside the kernel. So I just uh, enjoyed the Cilium presentation. Um, I wanted, there was a bug that went by, oh, a few months ago, back in April, that talked about their bandwidth manager. And the initial implementation of that had over two seconds of latency. I want to apologize to that crowd for losing my temper. But, if more of you could review the bug and the progress of the bug, you'll have a much more intuitive understanding of why buffer bloat exists and how we can possibly fix it. Their method is uh, different from most others, and I don't know if it'll be widely adopted in the container community or not. My biggest problem is that I thought that once we got SQL and DQL and all the embedded hardware in the world, that magically buffer bloat would vanish from the edge. And it turns out that kernels uh, don't get upgraded very rapidly. It's almost 10, running 10 years behind Linux kernel development. And I've uh, been at this for 10 years now and I'm looking at these global statistics saying that have we actually made a difference? And for smart users, we really have, but for the typical Joe average, probably not. And people are just used to it. So a couple of years ago, so we came up with the idea of creating middle boxes that can run things like Cake and FQ Coddle. A company called Precine uh, pioneered this model in about 2017. Uh, another company called Bequant adopted FQ Coddle as their secret sauce to do uh, interception and management of latency uh, at layers three through seven. Paracom adopted DPDK and Cake and LibreQOS, which I'm now a part of, started in 2021 which used all the latest and greatest stuff that I was so annoyed that it wasn't deploying yet. But together we've got less than about 3% of the entire ISP market and a bunch of other players like Sandby and not paying attention. So uh, a brief plug, LibreQOS is open source. Uh, we have over 175 ISPs around the world, particularly stuff in Africa has been very exciting, uh, as well as in Australia, New Zealand, South America, other places where the bandwidth is low and the latency is high. We've made a big difference for the quality of their video conferencing, et cetera. I want to thank uh, and on that for funding most of the development efforts so far. In addition to the shaping stuff, we learned that getting cool network monitoring tools in, in normal users' hands is useful. And I'm hoping that those of you that had the time to go install LibreQOS and play with it will get a really good kick at the level of detail we're able to extract from almost any kind of network. So for example, I'd love to see someone fiddling with WireGuard there. Um, this is a SAN key at the bottom here, which shows a very complicated ISP network, and over nine, nine layers deep over several hundred towers. And it, this particular plot shows stuff being green. Um, it wasn't green when this guy started uh, optimizing his networks using LibreQOS. The other cool plot in this one, and there's dozens more, there's things like mice and elephants and things like that. This is, this is what Amazon uh, Prime video streaming actually looks like in terms of its buffering across the system. And I'm kind of puzzled always as to why it is so random looking. It should be much flatter than that. But maybe that could be problems in the cloud. We don't know. Um, I don't really want to make this an ad for LibreQOS, except open source, go install it, check it out, tell your ISP about it. Because when you do this, when you actually manage the latency at the ISP first, you're able of getting a millisecond or five of additional latency on everything that you do, which is so much better than the worldwide reports I showed you earlier. And then there's 5G. 
it's wonderful we're seeing higher and higher 5G speeds, but this is actually a good number. It's only a quarter of a second of latency on your phone. Um, there's lots of other problems in 5G. I don't know how to fix it. Um, Toki's link over here is over 200 milliseconds when you use it. Ideally, you only want to be below 20 milliseconds. Another piece of how 5G operates is how bursty it is. And it turns out that they have a native reorder buffer um, that will put in another 200 milliseconds of latency just because packets must be delivered in order across the multiple channels. Anybody here working on 5G? Making it better? Implementing anything? I see Toki looking around. Toki, are you nodding? No, no one's working on 5G. Look, guys, we use this stuff every day. <laughs> and it runs Linux on top, usually. It would be awesome if we could make some progress on fixing the bloat in 5G. On the other hand, Starlink is looking really awesome. I'm coming to you live over Starlink, um, and I'm hoping this is pretty good. Um, in a matter of months, Starlink managed to improve the median latencies by uh, over 60%, and they've been at it uh, for about a year now, and across their entire network, they've really optimized for interactive traffic. If you look at, I have some plots showing how badly it works with TCP, but it turns out not to matter as much if you want to have a good video conference. A little packet loss is just fine. Who knew? If I could get more ISPs and more people to look at the kind of parameters they use to optimize their networks, the internet would get a lot better a lot faster. And most recently, last week was a really marvelous week. Um, they conducted a 40 minute video conference from space uh, that was almost entirely interrupted. They were only talking to one satellite. And over there, there's an open WRT box bolted to the sides of the spacecraft. So all of you have worked on Linux and on Bust the Bloat and, and so many other things. Be aware that your code is flying in space now and was used to make a really wonderful, wonderful video conference last week. Now, I still pay attention to a lot of the research. Uh, there's thousands upon thousands of articles about doing congestion control better. Uh, and this year alone, um, there was four that went by that looked really interesting. Um, DEQ and AQM annoyed me because it claimed it did better than COBOL, which is CAKE's congestion control algorithm, and I haven't had time to look at it. I think that slow start is the biggest source of jitter and latency that the internet has. And search uh, posted that seems to improve slow start somewhat. Also, the really exciting one, and the thing I would love someone to verify, is the FCCC, which uses microbursts to detect bandwidth availability pre congestion. It's a really simple and elegant idea, and the paper was excellent, and I disbelieve it. I don't, I want to believe it. It would be really cool if someone looked into that. And fairly recently, a very good version of Coddle 4P4 landed. So if any of you are using Totino switches, you might be able to control your latency a little better. Um, kind of an active part of the Buffalo Blow project is to make Wi-Fi fast too. This was originally run by Toki there, who managed to improve Wi-Fi's latency by, oh, 50, by a factor of 50 or more. And that's now the default driver set for most of OpenWRT and all of Linux. Um, I am a huge fan now. This is a uh, N279 board. Uh, it's four uh, in order A53 cores. It's pushing over a gigabit beautifully with consistent latency and a lot better than the vendor drivers. Uh, because uptake in the world is taking so long, I would love it if more people here, or at least one person here, was going to the 802 and 11 meetings at the IEEE because I would like to make sure that these kind of modifications we've made to how the stack works, make it into the next version of the standard. So if any of you are going to 802.11, get back to me. Uh, the biggest new project I got going is I finally got some funding from NL, NLNet and Comcast Research to go fix a bunch of minor bugs in FG Coddle and Cakes across a bunch of other operating systems, including Linux. And we're going to try to take a look at real traffic and real workloads from the either QoS perspective to see what more we can learn and modify. And the biggest problem that I think that Cake has is it really needs to be multi-core. And that turns out to be a really thorny problem that I would love to attract some people to work on. And that's it. The thing that I'm really happy about is watching Libre QoS take off and helping tens of thousands of people per week, new people per week, have a devoted internet.
So if you have any questions. And by the way, I don't hear anything in my in my headphones. Any questions? Questions? All right. Thank you, David. You hear us? Thank you for having me. Good catching the bright.